Day one of creation, God saw all that he had made and it was good. Day two, three, four, five, God saw all that he had made and it was good. Day six, the day on which he made humankind, God saw that all he had made and it was very good. And day seven, God rested, God savoured, God delighted, God was content. Contentment. I don't need to say this, do I? Contentment is what you desire. Uh, God tentment, uh, God contentment is what everyone else you know desires. Where do I find contentment? That is the great question of the world, isn't it? Where do I find contentment? And many of you here, maybe all of you, have found the answer. Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, says the Lord Jesus, and I will give you rest. I will give you contentment. Or, to use different words, verse 6 in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godly contentment, the contentment that God has, the contentment that God made humankind to have, that is what we're talking about this morning. Uh, you've spotted we're into the final chapter of 1 Timothy, uh, and throughout this letter Paul has been speaking about our spiritual health, our maturity, our growth, our, our godliness. The godliness that leads to contentment both in this life and the next. What was threatening the godliness, the contentment of the church that Paul was writing to? Well, throughout this letter, and we see it even here in the opening paragraph, verses 2 to 5, it seems that they were plagued by false teachers. Uh, People in a leadership position in the church who were not teaching the Bible. What were they teaching? Well, they were simply taking the surrounding culture, what everyone else was thinking, and they were rubber stamping that. Uh, And it seems in terms of money, they were doing the same thing. It seems that the church then, as today the church is, they were threatened by an unhealthy view of money. So, Deep breath, you can see my title. Um, Here's the question for this morning. What is the place of money in the contentment that God desires for you? My title, Godly Contentment and the Place of Money. Uh, And my first two headings, the danger I need to acknowledge, the contentment I can have. Just let me reread verses 6 to 10 and see if you can spot those two themes in those verses. The danger I need to acknowledge, the contentment that I can have. Uh, Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. What is the problem of money? The problem with money is that it is so good. Money provides me with 
food. It provides me with clothing. It provides me with a roof over my head. Um, People sometimes say things like, uh, money isn't important to me. And I think, well, what planet are you on? To, to, To try living without money. Actually, in my experience, the people who say money isn't important are the people who are very comfortably off indeed. Money is good. Money is vital. Hence the fact that poverty, the sort of poverty that leads to destitution, is an evil. Money is so good. But but here's the danger. We begin to see it as, and here one of my made-up words is going to come up, we see it as gooder than it really is. The danger of money is that we fall in love with it. And if we fall in love with money, uh, and please grasp the seriously devastating thing I'm going to say next. If we fall in love with money, we will lose our soul. We know the truth of verses 9 and 10. Those who want to get rich and fall into temptation and a trap and who and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Behind People trafficking and drug dealing and theft is a love of money. Behind fraudulent benefit claims, behind much household debt, behold, behind many people sacrificing their families for their jobs is the love of money. Why do we love money so much because it promises us contentment. That's why the lotteries are so alluring. Just just think what you could do with 20 grand. Just think what you could do with 20 million. And here's the insidious line, just in case you're wavering, think how much good you could do if you had more money and the contentment that would bring you. Now, let me tell you um, where I think most of us are with all of this. And I know this is a dangerous thing to do, me telling you what you think, but but bear with me. Please forgive me um, if this isn't you. Uh, But I think most of us have got the mindset, yep, I know money doesn't bring happiness, but I wouldn't mind giving it a try. Perhaps many of us, perhaps all of us would say, um, no, I don't want to be a multimillionaire. But it would be nice just to have a bit more. Uh, years ago, I had some friends in the, in the Chinese community. Um, and uh, um, from my perspective anyway, the Chinese community just have a phenomenal work ethic. Uh, and their motto when I was involved with them was, just another dollar. And I think, yeah, I don't want to be a multimillionaire, but just a bit more, just a bit more, I wouldn't say no. Listen to some warning words from Jesus. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let me just talk about myself um, for a second. Um, Am I, am I, Sean, am I personally in danger of loving money? Well, I live in one of the richest countries on the planet. 
I see advertisement after advertisement promising me the world if I buy certain products or certain holidays or a certain lifestyle. Uh, I'm surrounded by people with nice things who, who do nice things. Uh, am I personally in danger of loving money? You bet I am. And maybe you are too. Which is why Jesus told that story of the rich fool, even to poor fishermen. He told it to all his disciples. This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This is an imaginary person, but you know it's a real person. Uh, you know the person who had a, a very nice job, which provided a very nice income and a very nice pension, uh, that bought a very nice house, that housed his very nice wife and his very nice children. Uh, and, and one afternoon, just before his, his very nice Sunday lunch, he was sitting down uh, in his very nice conservatory with his very nice uh, gin and tonic in his hand. But then the chest pains came, and by the time the paramedics came, it was all over. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it the danger I need to acknowledge. But secondly, the contentment that I can have, verse 8. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Have you noticed verse 8 is an implied promise? What is the implied promise of verse 8? It is that if I have the necessities... I can be content. Those three profound prayers we pray week in, week out. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin. Deliver us not into temptation. Provision, pardon, protection. That is what we need. That is what Jesus promises for those who put their trust in him. That is godliness that leads to contentment. What all of us here know in our minds, but we nevertheless struggle to hold on to in our materialistic me, me, me culture, is that the answer to, to contentment is Jesus. We know in our minds that Jesus is sufficient, that Jesus promises to provide all that we need to be content that when we have the necessities, we materially have everything we need for contentment. Uh, just let me go off at a slight tangent and tell you how I cope with not doing some of the nice things that some of my friends do. Uh, if I read the Bible correctly, uh, the new heaven and the new earth is going to be just as physical as this planet. Uh, nature is going to be just as beautiful, perhaps even more beautiful. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be even more beautiful or it's going to be as beautiful and I'm just going to see it with clearer eyes. Relationships are going to be on a new level, uh, and I'm not joking here, food is going to be out of this world. And I will have the whole of eternity in the presence of the Lord Jesus, in his restored Eden, enjoying perfect relationships with his people and eating the finest of food and drinking the finest of wine. That is my future. That is your future. 
In this life, I have all the necessities. I have more occasional luxuries than I deserve. I have a growing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and with his people. I have the privilege, along with all Christians, of serving Jesus and his church. And I have a guaranteed eternal future, won for me by Christ's death on the cross. Do I not have cause to be content? The danger, I must acknowledge, the contentment I can have. And thirdly, the saviour I want to look to. All the way through his letters, Paul has warned us about false teachers uh, who essentially have been saying, um, yes, okay, Jesus is okay, but you can find contentment, or rather, you don't just need Jesus for contentment. You can find contentment other than solely in Jesus. That's what they've been saying. And here in verse 3, he says of them, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. And the last line of verse 5, we see that they too have swallowed the lie that the key to contentment is financial gain. Verse 5, they have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. No, money will never save me from discontent. Only Jesus can do that. And when we think about the Lord Jesus, uh, just think for a second. uh, Nine months and a day before that first Christmas day? Where was the Lord Jesus nine months and a day before that first Christmas day? He was in heaven. He was there enjoying the riches of heaven, which he then gave up completely. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. Oh, how cute, we say. No, it wasn't cute, it was raw poverty. The Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted. What a nice story, we say. No, it wasn't a nice story at all for Jesus. He was hungry. And the real temptation that came into his mind during that period in the wilderness was to grab some of his riches back to have a life of ease and of comfort and of luxury. Luxury. Man shall not live by bread alone, He answered the tempter. In other words, as he would say later, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions, but contentment comes from a relationship with God. I am the good shepherd, he said, with all that implies about his willingness and ability to love and protect and provide for his sheep. The saviour who I want to look to, to dissolve my discontent. Godly living and the place of money. Just four final thoughts which I put on the pew sheet. The life I want to live. Firstly, crying to Jesus dependently. When I'm struggling for the necessities, give us today our daily bread. That is a prayer of deep faith. But even when I have plenty, give us today our daily bread is a very wise prayer. Because it acknowledges that I only have plenty because of God's goodness to me yesterday. I need his mercy today if I am to have anything today. Whether I'm struggling, whether I have plenty, give us today our daily bread is a dependent prayer I am wise to pray. 
Secondly, spending wisely. Uh, The Pharisees loved to lay down rules and regulations for each other. Um, I cannot, I must not tell you how to spend your money. But just see what you make of that quotation that I printed on the bottom of the pew sheet there. We lay down no rules or regulations for either ourselves or others, yet we resolve to renounce waste and oppose extravagance in personal living, clothing and housing, travel and church buildings. We also accept the distinction between necessities and luxuries creative hobbies and empty status symbols, modesty and vanity, occasional celebrations and normal routine, and between the service of God and slavery to fashion. Where to draw the line requires conscientious thought and decision by us together with our families. Crying dependently to Jesus, spending wisely, avoiding hoarding. Let me build another barn, said the rich fool. Let me accumulate a bit more financial security. Where is the line between wise saving and excessive hoarding for you? I don't know. But Jesus tells us there is one. And the antidote for all of this, fourth point, giving generously, Just cast your eyes down to verse 17, will you, which Deb is going to preach on in a few weeks' time. Uh, Verse 17, the antidote to all of this, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. One billion people live in poverty. I am not one of them. By comparison, I am materially rich. Why did God cause me to be rich? So that I can be generous. Uh, And my experience, and that of many others, is that the more generous I am, the more content I am. Which, of course, back to Genesis 1, which, of course, mirrors God, doesn't it? Day seven in creation, our generous God rested. He was content. Godly contentment in the place of money, the danger I need to acknowledge, the contentment I can have, the saviour I want to look at, the life I want to live.